looked at Jesus in eternity past. Like it talks about in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. We looked at Jesus uh, before Bethlehem, uh, the creation, the prophecies, uh, His names, and so on. And uh, the Bible talks about all things were made by Him. But today we're going to look at Jesus, the Word was made flesh. It's more John 1, 14. I asked you to turn to Acts 2, and that, that's right. Don't get confused. Um, the Word is made flesh and dwelt among us. We're going to look at Jesus on earth. There's whole courses, Bible college courses, dedicated to the life of Christ. And uh, we're going to cover it in one service this morning. <laughs> so you can see, we're not going to go real deep. But... Uh, we're going to see a lot of things about the Lord Jesus this morning. We're going to look at his time on earth. In Acts chapter 2, Peter gives us a condensed version of the life of Christ. And as I read it, you'll see this is really condensed. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. This is not his whole sermon. I don't think we even have the whole sermon recorded here. But as he preached on the, on the day of Pentecost, one of the things he talked to them about was Jesus. His life and uh, the gospel. Acts 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye've taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. I'm going to stop reading there and go down to verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Now the this of that sentence is that the Holy Spirit had come, and they'd seen the evidence of that. Uh, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. You can see that's a very short version of, of the life of, of Christ. We're going to look at five things this morning. We're going to look at His birth, His life, His death, resurrection, and ascension. The Bible tells us that Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, Matthew chapter 1 and, and verse 20 is... A uh, very uh, uh, specific uh, scripture, Matthew 1, verse 20, is uh, Joseph. And the Bible says that while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. A quote there from, from Isaiah. Uh, born of a virgin. So important uh, that we understand that that is literally, physically true. Uh, he, he, Joseph was not uh, Jesus' father. He was his stepfather. Uh, but born of, of Mary. And because of that, uh, Jesus has two natures. He took upon him uh, the form of a servant, the Bible said. Uh, Jesus is God the Son. He's God, and yet he's also man, divine and human. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 9 and, and verse 6 is a, a verse that we often look at in, in this regard. Some of you probably know this by heart. Isaiah 9, 6, he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That shows the humanity and the deity of Christ. A child, he's human. And we'll look more at that. But also, a son is given. See, Jesus didn't come into existence at Bethlehem. He came from eternity. And look at the description that he continues with, if you're there in Isaiah 9, 6. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It's obviously talking about Jesus as you start. 
and then it describes him, he's God. He's man, he's God, both divine and, and human. Uh, like we saw there in, in John chapter 1, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and, then, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's, it's an amazing thing uh, to even think about. Uh, I won't read every, every reference, but another one is in 1 Timothy 3 where it says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. It's true. It's an amazing, great thing that God has, has done. And, and it continues, God was manifest in the flesh. It's just hard to even comprehend, isn't it? God was manifest in the flesh. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. I want us to look at several verses there. Philippians chapter 2 presents both the divine and the human side of the Lord Jesus. I love how God puts it here in Philippians 2, 6, talking about Jesus Christ from verse 5, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful way to put it? it, it he wasn't stealing when he said, I'm God. He, he wasn't grasping. He wasn't taking something that wasn't his. Uh, Jesus is uh, God the Son, e eternal. But then he goes on to the human side, verse 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He laid aside his glory, took upon him the form of a servant. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know, the Bible is able to trace Jesus' human history. We're looking in Sunday school, and probably many of you have looked at this. You know, the Old Testament is all about the coming of the Messiah. You know, God calls Abraham and all these different ones. He's able to say he's through Isaac and he's through David and he's through Judah and, and so on. Um, the book of Matthew starts, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He has a human physical history. Um, Jesus had a body. Jesus had a soul. Jesus had a spirit. Uh, he had a childhood. <laughs> you know, that, that's the thing that boggles my mind. And, uh, you know, the Lord doesn't tell us much about Jesus as a baby or even as a, as a young person, but he had a childhood. The Bible says in Galatians, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. He's human. He's also divine. And as a human, he had human needs. Uh, he got hungry. He got thirsty. He got weary, sleepy, sorrowful, and so on. But the difference between him and us is that all of that without sin. I don't know how you are, but when I get tired and hungry, I get cranky. <laughs> Not Jesus. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, verse 15, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. He's been through what you're going through, yet without sin. And that's the key. He's the Savior. His birth was different than ours in the sense that he was uh, uh, prophesied uh, where, when, all the things that would happen, but also that he's God manifest in the flesh. Very different. Uh, we'll live for eternity somewhere, but he's always lived for eternity in eternity past. And as you come to the, to the life of Christ, uh, I think it was John that said if, if they recorded everything, the, the books of couldn't record everything. And I was thinking about it today. You know, if you recorded everything God did, God does everything. <laughs> You'd have to have a book that told everything. And uh, we can't uh, cover everything about the life of Christ, but we can, we can look at some things. When uh, Peter was talking about it there in Acts, Acts 2, he, he said, A man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. Uh, his Probably the first thing we see in the life of Christ was his baptism as he came. And, and John pointed out, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit descended on him. And God the Father spoke from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we see the triunity of God right there at, at his baptism. The beginning of his ministry. Really, uh, by our standards, quite a young man, 30 years old. And only ministered for about three years. 
Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing, all that happened in that, that short time. Uh, we focus uh, hi history around that. You know, it's before Christ and after Christ. You know, the world doesn't like to use that term. They use different terms. But that's what it is. And, uh, you know, it's an amazing thing. And then from his baptism, uh, he went to his temptation. Matthew chapter 4 and uh, different places as uh, he was in the, the wilderness and, and tempted of, of the devil. And, uh, you know, as, as Satan would tempt him, he just replied with, with Scripture. T take a look in Luke chapter 4. Uh, i tell you what I did. is I just read through the book of Luke and just pulled out a, a, a few things that we'll remind ourselves of in, in the life of Christ. Luke chapter 4, verse 21 Jesus went to the synagogue. They, they gave him the book. I, I don't understand how synagogues work, but I guess if, if you're visiting or, I don't know, they, they, they have you say something. Well, Jesus took the book of Isaiah and he read about the Messiah. And then, in verse 21, he, he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. <laughs> Man. I bet you could have heard a pin drop, I don't know, or, or maybe it got, got noisy either way, but uh, here's, here's Jesus beginning his, his ministry. And you know, we forget sometimes, but one of the main things Jesus did is he preached. He was a preacher. Uh, in uh, verse 43 of, of that same chapter, he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God. And he did. Boy, he went, he went around uh, preaching. Verse 32, it says, They were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. It, it, I've heard some good sermons in my day, but it would have been amazing to hear Jesus preach. You know? We read it, and it, it, it comes alive even on the page, but uh, to have heard Jesus preach, in, uh, I'll just read you this verse, but in chapter 20, verse 1, it came to pass that, on one of these days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him, spake to him. They said, by what authority do you, you say these things? You know, it's an amazing thing that here is the Word of God presenting the Word of God. Uh, Jesus, in his, his ministry, uh, he preached. Of course, he, he did miracles. Back in chapter 4, verse 33, and we could look at many here, but... Uh, Chapter 4, verse 33, In the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and heard him not. And they were all amazed and spake among them, saying, What word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. <laughs> Jesus did many miracles. Verse 38. There arose out of the synagogue and entered into, I'm sorry, he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife, wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. He stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and, and ministered unto them. Just, just healed her. Uh, chapter 7, verse 21. At that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind he gave sight. You know, more than they could even list by, by name. Just many uh, different miracles as Jesus uh, worked with people. Of course, at this time he was also calling his disciples. In uh, Luke chapter 5, the end of verse 10. Uh, he calls James and John and Simon. He said to them, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. And of course, you know, he called the, the twelve disciples. And there were other people that, that followed him as, as well. And his call in uh, chapter 5, verse 31, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That was his call. And that call goes out to, to us today. And you see, 
uh, his deity in chapter 6, verse 5, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. <laughs> uh, he, he didn't have to, to worry about who he was. He knew who he was in uh, many different places. But for instance, chapter 21, verse 33, I tried to keep this in order, but I had to move about a little bit. This is just one thing I wanted to point out. Chapter 21, 33, he says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. You ever notice the personal pronoun there? Jesus said, my words shall not pass away. And what he's saying there is he's the word. He's the eternal word. And, uh, you know, what a blessing it is to know that that's our Savior. That's who Jesus is. But, you know, there's another thing we forget about Jesus in Luke 7, uh, verse 29. Jesus was the great divider. You know, as, as Jesus presented himself and his message, uh, families would be divided. People would be divided, as depending upon what they decided they believed about him. Luke uh, 7, verse 29, he says, All the people that heard him, and the publicans, justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. But the farriers, uh, farriers, Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of it. So people were taking sides. Some were saying, yeah, he's, he is the Messiah. He's, he's the one John said. He's the Son of God. Others said, no, he's the great divider. And he said that in chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 51. He makes that, that very statement. Suppose you that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you, nay, but rather division. God presents himself, and uh, we have to decide, are, are we going to believe who he is, what he says? In chapter 8, verse 23, uh, is a portion that shows the human and, and the divine. Chapter 8, verse 23, as they sailed, he fell asleep. There came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. They came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. And he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said unto them, Where is your faith? They, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. And you see his human side, you see his uh, divine side. He's asleep, <laughs> but when he wakes up, he calms the, the, the sea. Uh, what an amazing thing. In, in Luke chapter 9, you see the transfiguration as Jesus and uh, several of his men go to, to the mountain. Uh, Luke uh, 9, 29, As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. Uh, verse 32, Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory, and the two men that stood with him. Uh, the transfiguration, seeing the, uh, the glory of the Lord. You know, Jesus had a purpose in, in his coming. Sometimes the world will say, oh, yeah, he, he was a good example. But, you know, he didn't just come to be an example. He came to be our Savior. And when you read there in, in uh, Luke 5, uh, he, he didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. <clears throat> He'd have a hard time calling the righteous. In uh, chapter 18 and verse 31, really, Christ came to be the gospel. <clears throat> Luke 18, verse 31 it's amazing. He tells them this. He took unto him his twelve, the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Wow, there's the gospel. You know, when, when God defines the gospel, he says it's that Christ would die according to the Scriptures and be buried and rise again the third day according to the Scriptures. He said He's going to fulfill all that, that the Scriptures uh, has said. Jesus is the Gospel. Luke 19, verse 10, really uh, gives us His purpose when He says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ came to die. Christ came to be our Savior, the Lamb of God. You know, our, our theme is Behold the Lamb or... Uh, Mary had a little lamb, it really is our specific theme, but it's, it's the lamb. And uh, the answer is on the back, you can look if you want. Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's the lamb. 
And what a blessing it is that the, the life of Christ had a purpose in that he came to be that perfect lamb of God, the sacrifice that only he could be, calling sinners to repentance. Uh, in the four Gospels, every one of them has a heavy weight in the last week of Christ. Uh, about a third of, of each of the Gospels is the last week of Christ's life uh, because that's, that's when he was suffering and, and dying and, and rising and so on. In Acts chapter uh, 2, where, where we started, verse 23, he talked about being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. See, Christ was, uh, when Christ died, that's exactly what God intended for him to do. That's exactly why Christ came. Now, he lived, he lived a perfect life, but he came to die. Now, he gave his life is, is the important thing for us to understand. Uh, John chapter 10 and uh, uh, verse 17, he says, I, I lay down my life. He says, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. John 10 verse 18. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. Jesus Christ gave himself for us. And that's, that's an important thing to understand about the death of Christ. If you read the Gospels, you'll see there's several times when they try to take him and kill him and they can't do it. And the Bible will say, it wasn't his time. His time was not yet. When the fullness of time was come, that's when he was born. But as well, uh, I believe the fullness of time when, when he died. And the reason he came uh, was to give his life. There's so many verses, I've probably written down too many. Now, this is more of a study this morning than a, than a sermon, but uh, Matthew 20 and, and verse 28, he says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why he came. In 1 Corinthians 5, he's described as our Passover. Now, if you know about the Passover, when Israel was ready to leave Egypt... God said, I want you to take the blood of that sacrificial lamb and I want you to put it on the doorposts. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. When we apply the blood of Christ to our life, when we trust Jesus Christ, God sees the blood of Christ and will pass over. Our sins are forgiven. His blood is what makes salvation possible. You know, he had to be born. Uh, he had to be born the way he was and the way God had prescribed, and he had to live. But all of that was leading to his death, his burial, and his, his resurrection. In Ephesians, he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Christ died for, for our sins. In, in the Hebrews, it says, Without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. You know, uh, Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's not just the blood, it's the blood of Christ. You know, those uh, sacrificial lambs before Christ, those were temporary. Those were just looking forward to the permanent sacrifice, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And it's through His death, burial, and resurrection that He offers us life. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a blessing. Well, after his death, he was buried. I've always thought it amazing that they buried him in a borrowed tomb. Who borrows a tomb? I mean, really. <laughs> Jesus does. And you see his, his resurrection in, uh, uh, in Peter's uh, con condensed version of the life of Christ. He, he gave it a whole, whole verse. He said, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Death could not hold it. What's the song we sing? Death could not hold its prey. Jesus, my Savior. It's exactly right. That, that comes from Scripture. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible says, I declare unto you the gospel. And that's where he talks about, uh, well, let me look at it. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, 
that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. His resurrection. Christ rose from the dead, seen by many people, eyewitnesses. And really, this is the cornerstone of Christianity. If you want to find out about the resurrection, go to 1 Corinthians 15. and Verse 17, he says, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, Christianity is a fraud. But Christ did rise from the dead, and there's eyewitnesses uh, to prove it. Now, verse 19, it, he says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. <laughs> you know, Christianity is, is not the, uh, the answer for life today. It's the answer for life for eternity. Uh, there's some people who trust Christ, and man, that means they're going to suffer persecution, maybe even be put to death. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a better life. It does mean you'll have eternal life. And uh, that's what it's all about. And later on, he, he says, But now is Christ risen from the dead. And he rose from the dead in victory over sin and death. Sin and death is a, it's a big part of our lives. <laughs> We forget sometimes what a, what a big part. And later in that chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, the end of verse 54, he says, Death is swallowed up in victory. That's in Jesus. Verse 57, Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. That's the resurrection. And then the Bible says, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 1. It says that he was... On the earth, after his resurrection, for another 40 days. I'm not sure what, what all he did. We know a few things. Let me read Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive, after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the disciples saw him. Many people saw him. Evidently he was teaching and, and, and uh, commanding and, and so on. The ascension of Jesus Christ. He had promised that the Holy Spirit would come. Now there in the end of verse 4, he says, Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And, of course, Acts chapter 2 is about the coming of the, of the Holy Spirit. And he gave what you might say are his last words. He'd been teaching them all these 40 days, but verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. He gave his command, his call for us to, to be witnesses. And then he was, the Bible says he was taken up. Let me read it, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. It's just hard to imagine, isn't it? Here they are standing, talking to Jesus, and then he just rises up in the air and disappears. Now, I just kind of picture them standing there with their mouths open. If it had been me, I would have expected him to fall. <laughs> you know, you'd think... Oh, he's coming, he's, going to, yeah, he's going up, he's going to come back. Well, he is coming back, but it's not going to be for a while. Uh, the angel finally had to come and say, what are you doing standing here? He just told you what to do. He is coming back, just, just like he went. Jesus will come again. And yeah, what an amazing thing it is to, to know the Lord, God in the flesh. Jesus was made flesh and, and dwelt on earth, God in the flesh, uh, born of a virgin, the God-man. He gave his life for all sin, for our sin. He came out of the grave to conquer sin and death. He ascended back into glory. Salvation's work was, work was done. 
Bible said he sat down at the right hand of the Father. In Acts 2.36, uh, uh, Peter wrote it this way, that, that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Uh, Jesus talked several times about uh, going back to the glory that he had with, with the Father. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He sent the Holy Spirit uh, to abide in us, to, to teach us, to comfort us. You know, there's so much to the life of Christ. Uh, we've just looked at a, a few things this morning. And there's many reasons why Jesus came. Uh, I, I just want to list one verse in conclusion. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, one of the main reasons Jesus came is because God loves us. And God has a purpose. God has a plan. Now, right from the beginning of Scriptures, He, he had it worked out that the Savior was coming. Revelation talks about the, the one slain before the foundations of the world. You know? This was no surprise to the Lord. God loves us. And He wants us to know Him. He, he doesn't want us to perish. He wants us to have everlasting life. Later in, in 2 Peter, he records, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, that's why it's, it's so bad to, to say to someone, You go to hell. That's not what God wants. And God sent His Son to make the difference so that people don't have to go to hell. Uh, this, is, uh, this great God, uh, this lovely Savior, did all of this out of love for you, for me and for you. What, what a blessing it is that God became flesh. The Bible says that it's, it's our sin that separates us from God. And Christ is the bridge. Timothy recorded, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the God-man. He's the perfect Lamb of God. He's the only one who could, you know, in Revelation they said, who can open the book? The Lamb. The Lion of Judah. He's the only one who's worthy. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's not by good works. It's not by a church. It's by the person of, of Jesus Christ. That great creator became my Savior. That's just amazing. Let me ask you, won't you trust Him today? I hope you have already, but if, you, if you're not sure about your soul's salvation, trust Jesus. Trust is just another word for faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. In Romans, he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have God's promise. If you'll come to Him in faith, He won't cast you out. He'll receive you. He'll save your soul. Now, what a blessing. Let's go to the Lord in, in prayer with our heads bowed and in an attitude of prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. This wonderful Savior, this one who knows you and, and loves you, do you know Him? Father, thank you so much for sending your Son. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and being our Savior. Lord, we pray that uh, you'd help us to know you better, help us to know you. And Father, I pray if there are any this morning that are not saved here, that your Holy Spirit would convict them of sin and draw them to you. Lord, help us to be right with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to